If you're watching this video, there are two main options. Either you have heard of people making up languages, but you have no idea why they do it. I mean, what's the point of making a language that no one else is gonna speak, right? Or you like making up languages and you want to know what I have to say about it. Either way, let's begin. So, the question is, why would anyone want to make up a language? Well, it's different for everyone, but for me it started with secret codes. And I think that the appeal is pretty easy to understand, right? To be able to keep your secrets, to know things other people do not know, for you and your friends to communicate without no one else knowing. I wanted to create my own secret code, and the idea was really simple. I would just take the alphabet, and then I would replace each letter by some new letter that I would invent. But then something funny started to happen. I enjoyed more the process of creating these new letters than actually using my secret code. See, my native language is Mexican Spanish, and Spanish has much better orthography than English. Whenever you see a word, you can be 100% certain of how it is pronounced. And when you hear a word, you can be pretty sure of how to write it. The reason you cannot be 100% sure is because there are a few syllables here and there that can be written in several ways. Like se and si, he and he, ya ye ji yo ju. And finally, there can be an H literally anywhere because we write it even though it doesn't mean anything, it has no sound. It's crazy. And so I decided that my new secret code wouldn't have those issues. There would be a perfect one to one correspondence between sounds and symbols. And when I did it, it was beautiful. Because there is beauty in design, there is beauty in things done well. And I enjoyed it so much, fixing the orthography of my language, that I just kept going. I kept inventing new systems for encoding sounds with symbols. I even invented a logographic symbol, of which I still remember these two symbols. But all this time, I was inventing these new systems in order to write Spanish. The idea of inventing a whole new language had not even crossed my mind. And as with many, that idea, that inspiration came thanks to Tolkien. The first book I read of Tolkien was The Silmarillion, and I love that book. I still remember the scenes of the fall of the Gondolin, all the battles of Morgoth against the elves, the tragic story of Húrin and his children, the beautiful story of Beren and Lúthien, but what I remember the most are the names. Javanak Mentari, Elendil, Eru Ilúvatar, Marwe, Ulmo, Varda Elentari, Valinor. I did not know it back then, but I was experiencing euphonia, from the Greek eu meaning good and phonos meaning sound. It refers to the beauty of words simply by their sounds. Famously, Tolkien said that the most beautiful phrase in English was cellar door, and that he wanted to make up languages that were full of cellar doors. And I think he succeeded. The beauty of those sounds captured me, and soon I was in Wikipedia learning everything I could about the languages that Tolkien had made up and how they were written. I got so much into it, that my official signature is a stylized version of my name in Quenya. But you're gonna have to take my word for that, because showing a picture of my official ID in the internet is a bad idea. The point is that Tolkien had showed me another kind of beauty. The beauty of form, of how things are in the surface, while my secret codes had taught me the beauty of death, of how things work, of how they are designed. Finally, as I started learning about more languages, I realized that each language has its own personality, its own way to see the world that influences everything else about it, how it sounds, how it works, how it writes, if it writes at all. And all of this was beautiful. It was as if languages had been made by someone, 
and I could see the style of this author, like I could see the style of a writer in their prose, or the style of a painter in their strokes. At this point I realized that languages are art. Suddenly, Wikipedia articles about languages were like art galleries. Every verb system, every phonetic inventory, every aspect of a language, just another piece of art, which all together formed a greater work of art, the language itself. But who is the artist? Who is the author? Well, we are, the speakers. Every language is a massive collaborative work of art. That's why languages are always changing, because we are all artists and we keep making contributions to them, no matter how small they are. Languages are the greatest art projects in the history of humanity. Perhaps the first works of art we ever made. The work of art that made us human. A kind of art that comes so easily to us that we don't even realize we are doing it. You could argue that languages cannot be works of art because we are not intentionally making them beautiful. But I think we are. If we don't like a word, we don't use it. If we think something is too complicated, we simplify it. If we think something is too ambiguous, we make it clearer. And if we think a word is beautiful, we use it more. If we think a sentence structure is very clear, we prefer it. And just recently, English speakers decided that it was ugly not having a gender-neutral third-person pronoun, and so they change it. The bottom line is that if we thought the language we spoke was ugly, we would change it. And so languages naturally tend to be beautiful. And yet, not many people are captivated by the beauty of languages. I guess it's easy to see when they are ugly, but we are so used to them being beautiful that we don't even notice unless someone points it out. And that's the thing! There's a lot of beauty in languages, but it is a beauty that is very hard to appreciate. You need to learn a lot about grammar and phonology before you can appreciate the beauty of verb conjugations in Iau, spoken in Papua New Guinea, or the ergativity of Euskera, spoken in Spain, or the mind-blowing 16 tones of the tricky language spoken in Mexico. Meanwhile, anyone can appreciate a song. But of course, learning music theory or learning to play an instrument can enhance your enjoyment of it because you can understand how hard it is or you can understand the techniques of the author, but none of that is necessary. The same happens with movies, paintings, books, dance. Learning a lot about these forms of art can help you appreciate them a lot more, but none of that is necessary to appreciate them in the first place. In contrast, I had never seen the beauty of Spanish or English before I learned how languages work. And for this reason, the fact that I have so much more to learn about languages motivates me to keep on learning so that I can appreciate more of their beauty every day. I think this is why people decide to start making up languages. Maybe you see the beauty of the Swahili noun classes and the Mayan relational nouns and the transitive intransitive sapotec verbs and you think, wouldn't it be cool if there was a language that had all of those things? And so you decide to make it. And there is joy in making up languages. It can be really fun and really rewarding. But when you finally make a language and you want it to show it to other people, it's really hard because, I mean, you can describe the grammar, you can record yourself speaking it, but all of these are just pieces in the art gallery. It's not the whole thing. In my opinion, the only way to fully appreciate the work of art that a language is, is, well, to learn it. And this means that most people will only ever experience one or two of these forms of art in their entire lives. Imagine that, only being able to watch two movies in your entire life and only watching clips of other movies. 
But that's fine, because most conlangers, most people who make up languages, just do it for themselves. And, and Tolkien is a perfect example of this. He was making up all of these languages and he had no intention of showing them to anyone. We all just got to see them because one of his sons took the manuscript of The Hobbit to school, showed it to a friend, the friend showed it to his dad, and the dad just happened to own a publishing house. It was a very lucky coincidence. In conclusion, conlanging, making up languages, is an art form about a kind of art that is super hard to appreciate, and even those who are into it will only ever consume a few entire words in their entire lives. And for that reason, these artists just do it for themselves, to add to their lives a kind of beauty that nothing else can give them. Finally, I did not know where else to put this in the video, but remember how we are all artists contributing to the languages we speak? Well, this means that as the world changes and people change, languages become the result of the history of its speakers. Where they live, where they have lived, what other people they came in contact with, but also what kind of things they were doing, what kind of food they were eating, what kind of questions they were asking about the universe. Languages reflect the world, how it is and how it was. And when you understand that, you start seeing the world as a work of art as well. Which takes us to our next video, the beauty of world building. And if you want to see that, please subscribe, ring the bell so that you know when I upload it, and please give a like if you like this video. Thanks.